questions. I think there are a lot of people who would be enormously interested in games from a variety of perspectives if they realized that those games existed or could exist. Um, the culture of games is just so hostile and so insular that most people are, you know, most people who have values that are different are terrified to ever approach. Um, which is one of the reasons that I, I make the games that I do, that I make games about queer women and lesbian spider queens, because I want, you know, other people who are marginalized, other people who are queer to like, to encounter them and feel like, you know, to get excited about video games, to realize that this doesn't have to be just, you know, a safe space for straight dudes. So Dysphoria is a game that I made recently about the last six months of my life, which were the six months when I made the decision to um, begin hormone replacement therapy and dealing with you know medical gatekeepers and dealing with the physiological and emotional changes of the hormone therapy. And it's this very is this very short game um, that I made and put on the internet. I um, I put it on Newgrounds.com, which is a sponsor that I've worked with, with the pe in the past. And Newgrounds, you know, has that sort of insular culture that I've described. It's a place where, you know, the way I usually describe it is it's the place you go when you want to play a video game about clubbing a baby seal. Um, I was, you know, I put it there partly because I they were the only people, I think, who would have paid me for the game who would have actually sponsored it um, and also because I sort of part of what I try and do in my work is to confront this you know this insular culture this culture that doesn't usually have to do with oppression ever with um, with the other um, and sort of you know t to force them to recognize that you know that I exist that the Identities that I'm an ambassador for exist, um, and I was expecting that you know dysphoria would fill a similar role. It would have a really hostile reaction, but you know, people at least would have to acknowledge that trans people were making video games. In fact, it had a really sympathetic reaction, and people, um, even people who I think didn't understand it completely. Um, said that, you know, they at least respected me for putting my story out there. People, it, it seems, are either um, really intimidated by the other or they're really hostile toward it. You know, there's nerd culture is sort of really scared of what it doesn't understand. And since it's comprised mostly of dudes from you know from the top of the pyramid that you talked about there's a lot of things that they don't understand that are outside of their experience and um sort of convince you know convincing them that um i know my shit can be a tricky experience a lot of the time the idea of a lot of hackers that you know, the culture that they've built is, uh, you know, a, a pure meritocracy is absolute bullshit. Um, you know, hacker culture is as insular and as privileged as sort of any other bastion of, you know, of mostly straight whiteness. Um, and you, you know, even... Even more so because there is this this myth that you know it is a pure meritocracy that you know anyone that anyone will be judged you know purely by their contributions and that's not true at all no. and like you know one trip to Reddit I think is enough to dispel that illusion. There's I was super into like the Final Fantasy series um, and I really liked anime like Gundam Wing and uh, Fushigi Yugi and some other things and um, I liked to um, kind of remix a lot of those if you will like I, I liked you know kind of a slash fiction and you know putting 
you know, queerness in um, these stories. So I kind of felt like there was something there for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, um, I think, because there is such a like heteronormativity to these things that obviously I went to go do that and since there was a community to that also shared in this kind of queerness it was a very welcoming and I kind of felt like I could express myself a little bit more. Well, we see kind of like, you know, RPGs, like kind of that genre, and probably why I was attracted to them was that character creation and character choice and player choice is like super center in those games. And so uh, it kind of gave room for kind of more, you know, queer characters to be made. Um, and so I think that kind of furthering that and having more um, variable experiences is a really good thing. Um, also kind of just like modding culture overall like kind of helps like people will create mods to insert sort of sexualities or whatever and that tends to I, I kind of wish that more queer people knew about modding so they could you know kind of do their own kind of fan fiction but with video games right we are seeing a lot of people understanding that there are issues and that there needs to be work and right now it's taking a lot to convince a lot of people that this work is um, worth doing um, and right now a lot of people are just learning basically like what does it mean uh, to be you know what is diversity why do we need diversity you know is racism sexism etc still a thing um, and you know that sort of education that like kind of like industry-wide education is going on right now um, and we can see this within the past year um, kind of like conventions within the past year or so has been very much like a lot of diversity panels have been on there and advocacy has been kind of gaining you know a larger track on these um, in these events so I think that we're becoming more self-aware and we're starting to mobilize and start to figure out solutions I don't think there are many queer uh, characters, if any, in um, games right now. Uh, right now, we kind of have like a, a version of like a palette swap, so we kind of have like a like gender swaps, where basically we have characters that are like guess technically you know gay or something, but like don't really borrow from the context of queerness in our reality. So um, right now, we have a lot to do with actually representing queerness on that level. Um, and then the idea of like, what is a queer game? What does a queer perspective bring to gaming? Um, what does it mean to, um, there's like design itself is political. And I think that it is heteronormative and it is everything else. And so finding out like, you know, where that all comes in on um, a design level is kind of, um, very necessary in order to diversify our games so right now at the level of like there being a gay or so character is not enough like we haven't really even broached that just yet most designers tend to be like heterosexual white men um, and also many people of in game design started in game design or came from computer science and I don't think there's a lot of the humanities and critical theory and other things like right now we're having a hard time getting writers and other people to interact with games as something besides a consumer object. Um, and so I feel like this kind of conversation is just not happening. And I think once that conversation happens, we'll see a lot more of this, you know, different play, different design coming on. So the solution is to make sure that everyone is making games of all identities, all backgrounds, all whatever, um, that the barriers to entry to making games isn't just reserved for that you know, dominant identity. Um, and with that, you'll get different stories, different designs, different experiences, and everything else that I could say kind of just falls under that. Basically, having different perspectives, getting, you know, different people on your teams, you know, having different stories, that all comes on after having, a, you know, a diverse amount of people making games. So, ultimately that needs to happen on the corporate level that needs to happen in indies that needs to happen on a wide scale in our society it's just basically more people more different people making games um, one of the advantages i had as um, a games master as opposed to a player is that i could play lots of female characters without it looking at all unusual um, i mean there were you know, I knew one or two people who played cross-gender as uh, on a fairly regular basis, um, and that was okay. But when you're um, a young trans person and you're very much afraid of people finding out about you, 
you don't want to draw attention to yourself in, in that way. But as Games Master, I was able to play a whole bunch of female characters um, and um, you know, have, uh, have no problems as a result. Um, certainly anybody of my generation, people who weren't able to transition until relatively late in life, um, people who have therefore experienced male privilege, the change, change in social attitudes when you finally get to live your life as a woman is really quite marked. And I don't see how anybody can be uh, a male to female transsexual and not be a feminist. One of the very useful things about both science fiction and fantasy is that they postulate a world which is different from ours. Now, that world can be different in many different ways. You know, it could be a world in which people are able to fly. It could be a world in which we have aliens and faster than light travel. But it can also be a world in which you know, the, um, the dominant um, social groupings in, on Earth are African. It could be a world like the one postulated in Joe Haldeman's Forever War, in which the majority of um, relationships of people on Earth are homosexual. Um, there's a variety of interesting things that you can do, and that allows you to talk about a whole lot of issues in ways that will encourage your readers to think about them perhaps a little bit more deeply than they would otherwise. It may have been back in like the, the 1950s and 60s when everybody was convinced that we were going to be living on the moon come the 21st century uh, and that aliens would have landed and, and whatever. But nowadays, um, you know, we, we realise that making predictions about the future is a, a complicated business. And at the same time, there are an awful lot of things here and now that uh, we could talk about in useful and interesting ways through the medium of both science fiction and fantasy. Meritocracy is, is a fascinating subject um, in that most of the people who believe uh, strongly in a meritocracy are starting from a position of fairly substantial privilege. Uh, in particular, they are young, male, white, cisgendered, straight, and they believe that they are better than everybody else because they have this position in society as a result of all the privileges that they have. And really, no. Um, they uh, don't, really, um, don't really warrant the uh, position that they have because most of it has been given to them on a plate. Any community that you're part of, you'll get a lot of debate over sexism, um, you know, racism, homophobia, transphobia, whatever. Um, so there are, there are many things wrong with the science fiction community. Those things are things which are also wrong of society as a whole. And in many ways, the science fiction community, I think, is somewhat better than society as a whole. Um, there are a number of very prominent trans women in the, the community. I'm just one of them. Um, and the reaction that we get from at least, you know, convention going fandom, fanzine fandom, whatever, um, is generally pretty welcoming. Um, you know, if, if I get into trouble in fandom, it's because I've said something, you know, to do with fan politics, or I've said the wrong thing about a book that people love, not because I'm a trans woman. Very, very interesting things happen in fan fiction, both um, in the area of um, um, homosexual relationships, but also in um, recasting popular characters in uh, other genders. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the um, fiction about trans people tends to occur in, in fanfic um, initially, that you know there are people who will perhaps cut their teeth in fanfic and then go on to, to write interesting stuff later. But fanfic is um, it's a venue in which you can write whatever you want because you don't have to worry about publishers and consequently people who want to write about trans issues feel safe to do so. Speculative fiction 
is one of the places where we are we can be comfortable with expressing a lot of the the crap that goes on in our lives. Uh, it's also a place where we can imagine a world, you know, just, uh, not 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 you know futurism per se, but just imagine what a world would be like where there there wouldn't be a problem uh, with with us just going outside trying to get a job, <laughs> trying to you know date, trying to 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 to, to, to hang out with people. Um, it's getting better, uh, but we have there's a huge amount of, of cultural baggage that we're, we're taking on. I mean, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that a lot of people, uh, writers, you know, uh, ha- have issues with with putting trans people in, this, in their stories when they're not trans themselves, but are no trans people, is that you don't just put a trans person in the story, you put the entire society in the story with them. You put uh, the society where the trans person lives. That's you know, you, 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 you put in the way that, you know, they look at, get looked at when they go down to the store, you get, you, you put in a society's gender norms. And a lot of people are just not comfortable with that. So they just, you know, stick token trans person in and, and then they don't realize that they've just stuck the entire society around that trans person. And when they were trying, trying to before just focus on, on whatever, and they just wanted to have a weird character or something. And that's the problem, and that's uh, one of the things that you really have to be mindful of. Speculative fiction is our world. Speculative fiction is the place where we get to go and you don't get to come. And if you do come, and we do actually want you to come, you get to be on our terms. You don't get to shove us in a role. You don't get to pretty us up, show us, and, and then kill us off in order to make yourself feel bad. You don't get to, you know, throw us into, in, in, into your own uh, sexual fantasies. You don't get to reflect on us through whatever, you know, sexual fetish lenses that you got. Speculative fiction gives us control back of a situation that we don't have a lot of control over. Uh, working with engineers nowadays, these are old guys. They are going to be coming to me with all kinds of baggage from 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 the, when they grew up. Uh, it's never, it's never uh, uh, that easy at first. The first six months, I I went back uh, to the, the process control job was absolute hell. I was thinking about quitting um, just because it was so. There was this this complete atmos- uh, 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 oppressive atmosphere of you know you know what are you you know what, what what happened to you what are how are we supposed to supposed to deal with you where's your place in this organization um you know you get you get deer a lot you know you get that's nice deer you know we can do this um but uh, but after you know i, I i've since i've become so basically the, the since the 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 entire environment has been cut to the bone since there are, you know, literally, you know, there's the literally there's like we're, we're at a, a skeleton crew for the operation that we're doing. Pretty much everybody is uh, is a little better uh, at uh, at communication now. A lot of the fact is that, they, that I get a break because uh, my dad worked there since the '60s, and so I get the the sibling break. And a lot of people do. Unfortunately, it's one of those places where a lot of the people who are currently working there work there because their 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 parents work there. Um, as I said, it's not a it's not an ideal situation for me, uh, but it's it's worked out very well. I've been extremely lucky. I hope to come across uh, as, as as a very very lucky person because, and I'm absolutely terrified. Of this it could all go away just like that. There's a very clear difference between my sister and I. I mean, I think we, um, you know, fundamentally we were as skilled as each other. Um, We could have had the same potential as each other. She was, and and through no maliciousness or anything, she was very much encouraged towards um, or away from things like science and maths and and computing, um, for sure. Um, Whereas I was actively encouraged towards it. Um, And I think if if you compare, obviously, you know, bringing up uh, two little boys is an amazing achievement and I would never wish to detract that but actually I feel that we're almost missing an opportunity because I think the main reason that I have been so successful and I've been able to build such a um, you know a, a, a nationally renowned business that's now making waves and you know, even in the British government 
uh, supply market with you know without any external investment or anything um, is that I have quite a unique perspective um, that's been brought by um, being female but having had a male upbringing um, and I think still girls today aren't being um, afforded that that opportunity and it's something that I've, I'm, I'm, I start to do some some work on within the IT industry to really try and encourage girls towards IT not not at sort of 15 or um, 16 but actually really quite young you know at sort of ages of, of six and seven and it's starting to filter through now we are still starting to see an improvement at least in the schools I think as a culture we're very used to a, um, a binary gender system um, you know there's the boys in blue and girls in pink kind of mentality I say I don't think it's malicious I don't think it's any Thing conspiratorial, um, but I think it's very hard to undo. It's something that we're not really taught in schools. It gets handed down from generation to generation. Um, I think in the past as well, we, we need to remember that only a few decades ago, the entire idea of, of uh, being transgendered um, was—I mean, it, would, it was just you know um, completely taboo. Um, I mean, it was you know way beyond. Um, uh, you know, being homosexual even, for example. So it's only very recently that it started kind of, um, and, and, and even then, not just about the take, leaving out the trans thing altogether, the idea of um, men and women being equal. I mean, that actually wasn't that prevalent only six or seven decades ago. Um, so if you think of it as a generational thing, I think it, it, it's taking some time for the, the people that viewed the world like that to kind of die out and with them their views to, to go. It's a slightly horrible way of putting it, but um, I think it will, will happen in time. See, when I was growing up, I was very confused because I, I didn't have uh, the word transsexual in my vocabulary. So there were these transvestite people who I didn't really understand and they were you know, just a bit gross, at least the portrayal in the, on, on the television. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to be treated like a girl, and it wasn't really a, I, I don't know, it was, it was quite confusing, and I didn't really, you know, the clothes were appealing, but that didn't seem to, that, that wasn't fulfilling. Um, so when I discovered MMORPGs, um, and actually it was before that, so I used to play um, uh, sort of uh, pen and paper role-playing games with my, mm. um, with my friends, and, you know, it, it was always just fact, you know, uh, Bob always plays a girl, that was my, my old name, and they just kind of accepted that. Um, and that's where it started, the idea of being able to have a fictional self. But with MMORPGs, with the kind of very interactive nature of them, um, that was really when kind of my, my full identity was allowed to be, to come out. So all, all those parts that I'd been suppressing, and, and suppressing really hard, I mean, a, a really telling point was that, you know, I never used to drink, um, because if I'd have a glass of wine, um, I'd suddenly become extremely effeminate, and people would kind of raise eyebrows. Um, because you know I was a, apparently a um, heterosexual guy, and they didn't understand the, the the difference. So yeah, MMORPGs was really where I suppose I as Kate was born. Um, I started getting more and more friends. I was able to be um, more of an extrovert. Um, and yeah, it was actually there that I met some people who um, were like me for the first time, and I started to actually understand that you know that there was this idea of gender and sexuality being separate. And that you know, I didn't need to be desperately ashamed, which is how I'd grown up. You know, I was just desperately ashamed of this, just desire to be to be female. Um, and yeah, that really kind of gave me the nudge to go and start exploring. And, and then I found that actually, you know, it, it wasn't my mind that was wrong; it was my body. I found uh, the. I wasn't actually that into comics uh, when I was younger, mainly because it was just um, action sci-fi stuff, and I don't really care what um, a cisgendered white kid really um, is sort of, oh no, I've got superpowers, oh well, that must be really hard for you. Um, so the idea of writing my own comics and writing about stuff that I thought uh, would be interesting um, is what spurred me to it. That would have been when I was about uh, 13, 14. I do read a lot of um, online slash fiction. Um, that would be another thing that sort of like always been one of my loves on the internet is fan fiction and slash fiction of all things, um, which coming from a sci-fi point of view, um, 
there's a lot of it out there from the sort of like um, slash fiction comes from the whole um, whole there's my lack of Star Trek knowledge um, coming through um, it used to be the Spock slash Kirk and that's where the term slash came from right. um, is it, <laughs> um, normally taken to mean sort of like um, gay fiction but um, also just sort of general stuff really um, and yeah, I started reading that from probably when I was too young to be allowed to read it, let's be honest. I'm writing out the uh, dedication to the Tom and Alex stories, and one of the things I'm writing is that I just wanted to write something that had trans characters that weren't the villain, the joke, um, or just sort of like the butt of all stereotypes. Um, so yes, I just wanted to write trans people as people. But yes, it's always uh, very daunting um, to write, uh, write write a minority character as human because uh, some of the easiest thing you can do as an author is you write a minority character and you make them sort of absolutely perfect and wonderful and a great person. Um, writing a minority character as flawed is very difficult because human beings have this weird thing it was a bit like this person has written this this way therefore they must mean that all people are like this uh, most um, male to female cross players that I see do Yuri characters from animes and things like that just because they sit down they sort of like watch these shows they love uh, the girl characters from it and they decide yeah why not let's do it I and mean, some people do it for a laugh because it can be very funny um, and some people do it and they're absolutely amazing at it. But I do think I do get a lot of people who are uh, trans or experimenting with their gender will do it first because it's a safe, you know, community that you won't get bullied for in. Um, to be honest, um, it, it can be quite tricky because you never really know if someone's trans, you never know if someone's just cross-dressing, you never know if anything's like that. But uh, it encourages you to ask, um, we have this uh, quite a horrible thing in Britain where we don't really talk about much things and we don't, you know, ask things because, oh, no, no, that wouldn't be polite. Um, so I've had, and, you know, you've had to learn to ask, you know, oh, what pronouns do you prefer? Or, you know, uh, the main step is, oh, what's your name? That normally helps a little bit, but uh, can be quite tricky. Um, but yes, I do think um, a lot of people will use that as a first step for realising, oh, actually, I do feel more comfortable with, say, being a male character. I do feel, oh, sometimes um, what I've seen happen is friends that I know um, have done cross plays and then been pleased with the results and find themselves very pleased when someone uh, mistakes them as a boy or something like that. And then realised through experiencing what it's like um, that this is something they want to do more permanently and then they sort of move on from using male pronouns and that kind of thing um, because I think in the media um, transition is portrayed as a you know a big snap decision you know it's just like that uh, and one day I wore a frock and that was it you know um, but it's really more of a slow learning of yourself over time and picking and choosing and picking and choosing little bits to do with your gender and how you see yourselves and coming to uh, some form of conclusion at the end of it or maybe you never come to a conclusion it's something you know for some people it's like this is you know how it is some for some people it's you know uh, a slow discovery of themselves over time